My name is James Simon. I'm the Director of International Resources uh, at CRO. It's nice to see you all. Uh, my only role today is actually uh, to uh, have the pleasure to introduce to you um, the person who needs no introduction, uh, President of CRO, Bernie Riley. My role is to introduce the moderator of the session, who will be Chuck Henry. But just, uh, just, I wanted to say a few, a few things before I introduce um, Chuck Henry. Then, and that is that, why did we do this? The um, New Horizons and Primary Source Research. We uh, this morning, and the, those of you who are here, um, were here when Richard uh, Fife uh, announced the awardees of the Primary Source Awards. Um, the Primary Source Awards was established really not to um, reward people so much for using primary sources because we didn't think the use of primary sources is reward in itself. Um, primary source research being extremely important. But the, our purpose for starting that award program was for us to find out more about what people are doing with primary source sources. These are the, prime, the, the basic evidence of human existence and the basic evidence of human accomplishment, the human achievements, and human identity. And they are um, materials that we don't talk about much as librarians. We talk a lot about books, we do monographs, sorry. We talk a lot about serials, we talk a lot about serials budgets, uh, but there's this whole substrate of materials that um, we, don't, we don't devote a lot of, a lot of time and, and attention to these days. We found that these, um, these primary materials are becoming extremely heavily used and extremely important in, in scholarship, not just in historical research and humanities research, but in economic research, uh, in finance, uh, in the study of finance, the study of political systems, those kinds of things that um, researchers are mining these collections, some historical collections, um, quite heavily for new knowledge, new information. Um, a few years ago, we were doing, a, a, we were doing an analysis of a, uh, the Associated Press, and we were um, talking to them about their archiving, because you know that's one of the biggest news organizations in the world. We were wondering, well, what's going to happen to all their stuff? And at that point, they were into their second generation digital repository, their own second generation digital repository. And they, we were talking about preservation horizon on that. And first of all, the word preservation to them is, doesn't re really mean that much. But we said, well, how long is this material important to you, the contents of, in this repository? And they said, well, our rule of thumb has been um, nine months. And um, <laughs> because after that time, you're probably not going to reuse it. And it's probably, if you're going to get sued for something you printed, it's probably going to be before, within nine months. So at least you're going to know within nine months what you're going to get sued. But they said, recently, we've got these guys from the hedge funds coming over and saying, we're interested in the last 10 years of your AP business wire text because we've got programmers that are mining it for information about the performance of particular companies, particular executives, particular stocks, and those kinds of things. And it became clear that the um, that this is primary documentation. I mean, they, this is stuff that was created as news, as to be a throwaway, and it's now become uh, the primary material of a lot of research, both in the academy and outside of the academy. So that's really the, uh, the purpose of this afternoon, to, to give us a better sense of what the, um, what kinds of primary source, what kinds of work is being done with primary sources now. And then to talk about um, what, the, um, what, what the implications are of that for libraries. A lot of the users that we've seen have been are users that are working directly with the publishers of data, like those hedge fund guys that, with Associated Press. They go right to the source. Um, in the past, the libraries always kind of mediated that activity, and so we'll see um, we'll see this afternoon about how various libraries are mediating that activity, how these kinds of activities are going on on campuses and universities in the uh, within the CRL community. So. Uh, that's it for me. Uh, Chuck Henry is going to moderate the session. We're very happy to have Chuck, who's the Executive Director of CLEAR, Council on Library and Information Resources, and I'm proud to say a member of the Center for Research Libraries Board and into his second term. So, Chuck, 
They, um, uh, there'll be four presentations uh, this afternoon. And uh, what I'll do now, we agree that I would um, go through and identify the speakers and their topics and then give you a brief bio on each and kind of just go through the list and then we can start with the presentations after that. Um, sort of ground rules, uh, at the end of each of the presentations there'll be some, uh, a short period allotted for questions that have to do with clarifications. If there's aspects of the presentation that weren't too clear, you won't have a, sort of a small question about it. Uh, that would be the time to ask it. Then we would save the more substantive conversation for the end of the, um, of after, after the fourth presentation, trying to bring all this together. Um, the first group up would, um, the title is Analysis and Visualization Using Large Bodies of Electronic Text, What Chicago Humanities Faculty Are Up To. Uh, the presenters are Peter Leonard, Associate Director for Research Computing, Division of the Humanities, and Elizabeth Long, Associate University Librarian for Digital Services, University of Chicago. Um, Peter is Associate Director for Humanities Research Computing at Chicago before completing his doctorate in Scandinavian literature uh, at the University of Washington. He served as lead technologist for Columbia University's Center for New Media Teaching and Learning. He is the co-PI for a Google Digital Humanities grant to computationally analyze thousands of Nordic language volumes in Google Books. Elizabeth um, is Associate University Librarian for Digital Services, also at Chicago, where she has worked for the last 19 years. From 2000 to 2011, she was co-director of the Digital Library Development Center, where she managed the library's website, built digital collections, and worked with faculty on digital projects. In her new capacity as AUL for digital services, she expands that role to developing new library digital services and leading campus-wide initiatives to support faculty in their emerging e-research needs. The second presentation is entitled Overview of New Work with Documentary Sources by History, Media, and Public Affairs Scholars at George Mason University. Uh, the presenter in this, for the second um, uh, subject is John Zanellis. John uh, has been leading George Mason University's library system for 14 years now, while also fulfilling additional responsibilities as Associate Vice President for Information Technology during the past 10 years. Before going to uh, Mason, he was at Temple University where he served first as Associate, then as Deputy, and afterwards as Acting University Librarian. Earlier, he had uh, held mid-level uh, management positions at Columbia University's library system. He began his career in research librarianship at the research libraries uh, at the New York Public Library. Mr. Zanellis' current external professional activities include the following. A Washington Research Libraries Consortium, the Library Advisory Committee of the State Council of Higher Education for Virginia, along with landmark statewide virtual library of Virginia program, and the Association of Southeastern Research Libraries uh, where he is now serving as a member of the board. The third presentation is entitled The Short History and Long Future of Human Rights Documentation, A Tale of Three Archives. Uh, the presenter is Pamela Graham. Uh, Ms. Graham serves as the director of the Center for Human Rights Documentation and Research um, at Columbia University Libraries. She has held the position of Latin American and Iberian Studies Librarian at Columbia uh, from 1997 to 2011, and prior to that time uh, worked at Duke University's library as a specialist in uh, Latin American, Iberian, and Caribbean studies. Pamela has been active in professional organizations, serving as president of uh, Salam in 2008 and 9, and was chair of the Latin American Microform Project at CRL uh, between 2001 and 2004. More recently, she was an advisor to CRL's MacArthur Foundation-funded Human Rights Electronic Evidence Project. She holds an MA and PhD in Political Science from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. The final presentation this afternoon is entitled Old News, New Research, Observations from the Field. Presenter Deborah Cheney, um, Larry and Ellen, who is the Larry and Ellen Foster Communications Librarian and Head News and Microforms at Penn State University Library. Um, 
As the Larry and Ellen Foster librarian, she works closely with the faculty and students in Penn State's communications uh, majors, with Penn State's communications majors, including journalism and media studies. As the former head of the News and Microforms Library, her work is focused on the challenges of large academic libraries uh, with that face in providing access to news content for teaching and research, and the role of libraries in providing access to content that is increasingly electronic and delivered via the internet. Uh, she has authored uh, many articles um, and um, has, uh, uh, I'm losing my college and research, including college and research libraries journal and presented papers related to news content use, marketing and promotion at newspaper section meetings of the International Federation of Library Associations, uh, IFLA at New Delhi and Kuala Lumpur. Um, so those are the four presentations that we will um, listen to this afternoon. And again, following each, there'll be a brief period for, for kind of small scale questions and then opening it up at the end. Uh, we also have the benefit of, of um, uh, commentators who will help uh, guide the conversation and also um, add to, uh, I think, which uh, what is a very rich agenda here. Um, I'll be one of the commentators and uh, I'm delighted also to welcome Beverly Lynch. Um, Beverly, would you? There you are, you're here, great. Good afternoon. And David Magier. Uh, Beverly is Professor of Information Studies, UCLA Graduate School of Education and Information Studies. And David is Associate University Librarian for Collection Development at Princeton University. So let's get underway. Uh, the first presentation will be analysis and visualization using large bodies of electronic text. And we introduce Peter Leonard and Elizabeth Long. So while Peter brings this up, um, just to give you a sense of how we've approached this, he's going to do really the bulk of the presentation talking about, about four different projects that we've been working on with faculty. And then interjected between these, I'm going to raise some of the challenges that people, that faculty have faced and some of the kind of implications for the library and how it's made me start to rethink um, the kinds of activities we're doing and support we're providing. Thanks very much, Elizabeth, and uh, thanks all for the opportunity to come here and speak with you today. I'm really happy to be presenting alongside Elizabeth Long, because although I describe the work that I do as digital humanities, um, I think that there's an increasing realization in the field that no serious and long-term digital humanities work can be done at research universities without the long-term expertise of people in the library. So it's wonderful that Chicago has an AUL for digital services, and Elizabeth and I are already working together pretty closely, and I anticipate doing even more of that as we try to meet the needs of, in my case, humanities faculty. So what we've been asked to present for you today is under the broad rubric of New Horizons in Primary Source Research, as we just heard. And um, the question that Elizabeth and I kind of wanted to bring in front of you was, if we start from 2012, if we just say, going forward from 2012, what do faculty consider valid primary sources for digital investigation? And how do they want to read those sources? And I've put read in scare quotes, because hopefully as we go through this presentation, we'll see some interesting ways of reading that don't just involve the traditional methods we all learned in graduate school. But once we know this, once we know what the sources are and how we want to read them, then hopefully we'll start to be able to identify how libraries can build collections of these new types of sources and how libraries can help support new forms of this kind of reading. So let's begin with our, um, with our theme here. I can, you know, electronic data, electronic text, one of the things that I think to want to kind of propose here is that everything is a text, right? So, um, but let's take the most simple example of an electronic text, which is a literal text. We all have experience in this room working with electronic texts. We know about how to scan books, how to work with repositories. We know that uh, going forward, the Hathi Trust Research Center is going to be an important player in this world. We all know how to work with manuscripts. We know how to mark them up in semantic XML. We know how to put them into corpus query engines. We have a great one at Chicago called Philologic, which comes from the Artful Project. <laughs> But the real important question is, let's assume that's a solved problem. Let's assume we have haughty trust for our books. Let's assume all of our manuscripts are in, in Philologic. One of the things I want to point out as we move through this presentation today is a possible motion away from a kind of scholar-generated query as being the only thing we do with data, and towards data itself being responsible for the generation of its pattern, 
And that's not to say that we will move completely away from humanists knowing what to look for in a text, but merely an argument that in a big data world, you won't always know what you're looking for until it emerges from the data itself. So we use this phrase, let the data organize itself. This is what astrophysicists do when they have a radio telescope, which is giving them way too much data to look at, and the question is, how do you se separate signal from noise? There are a lot of techniques that come outside the humanities you know, from fields such as information retrieval, computer science, mathematics, statistics. Um, you've heard of things like topic modeling, uh, latent Dirichlet allocation, latent semantic analysis. Um, if you haven't heard of these things, you will in the future. That's the only way to make sense of 20 million books. But the thing I'm going to talk about today actually is a little um, lower on the mathematical scale, and it just has to do with sequence alignment. And uh, has anybody ever heard of sequence alignment? Raise your hand if you heard of sequence alignment. Okay. Most geneticists, most biological scientists know about sequence alignment because it's a way of finding patterns in the human genome. We're going to talk about it today not in the domain of biology, but in the domain of literature. Your professors are all already using sequence alignment, even if they don't know it. They're using sequence alignment every time that they use one of their undergraduates, uh, submit their papers through websites like turnitin.com or checkforplagiarism.net. And even if your campus doesn't use a plagiarism detector, if you use Blackboard, there's a module in Blackboard which can optionally check undergraduate work for regions of similarity with Wikipedia or other corpora of essays which people have turned in before. The underlying math here is trying to find patterns of textual reuse, areas of textual reuse. But plagiarism is maybe the least interesting thing that we can do with sequence alignment. At a meta level, what sequence alignment is about is finding things that overlap, right? Alignments of sequences, whether it's genomes or words. One of the things we can discover with sequence alignment, which is pretty banal, if you put it through 15 million books, you'll find um, set phrases that occur over and over. Now, these aren't, uh, this isn't plagiarism, this isn't citation, this is just thing, the way people talk. So you get a lot of examples of once upon a time, right? You can also find things like um, references from outside the corpus, right? So if you analyze 18th or 19th century literature, you find a lot of quotes from the Bible, right? Not, again, not plagiarism, it's just a common reference point. And one of the things this brings up is you have to think carefully about your corpus when you're running these types of algorithms. Did you think that second century Hebrew would be relevant to 19th century American literature? Well, it is if there are a lot of Bible quotes, right? And finally, the point I want to make on this is that not everything is pure plagiarism or un, un, um, unfootnoted citation. There's this notion, you know, of Thomas Mann has of kind of higher cribbing, right? People have identified this book uh, called Lolita from like the 20s. Um, and it's a broad outline is similar to what Nabokov wrote. It's not, he, you know, he was inspired by it, right? So the notion here is that good artists copy all the time. So what can I actually show you that's concrete, that explains how we can identify textual reuse within a corpus? Well, we've been running some analysis in Chicago recently on about 900 classical Latin texts. And what I'm showing you on the screen, and I apologize, I don't know how clear this is, is a chord diagram or a chord graph showing connections between Virgil and other texts. And this is probably too hard to read on the screen, but what you're seeing is one text has a lot of connections with other text, right? So this would suggest, if you're a classicist, that Virgil is kind of an important person and people seem to kind of refer to him a lot, right? Now, in order to make this a little easier to understand, I can show you an example in English, which is based on a bunch of speeches that are given to incoming University of Chicago undergraduates every year. Uh, we call this um, the aims of education, and it's a famous Alfred North Whitehead um, essay from 100 years ago. But if we go through and we find maybe Hannah Gray, um, you remember her, uh, we can find speech that she gave, and we can find patterns of overlap. I'm going to find one with Alfred North Whitehead. So here is um, Hannah Gray giving a talk uh, in the 80s, and she says, uh, we have to be careful of what we call inert ideas, those ideas that are merely received and that aren't tested. Well, of course, this is a direct quotation from Alfred North Whitehead. I didn't, I mean, I could have guessed that Whitehead would have been important. He gave the first Ames of Education speech, but the point is the algorithm found it for me, and it's identified that, and it showed me on this chord graph how many sequences she shares with not only uh, Alfred North Whitehead, but other people who've delivered this talk over time. Back to our slideshow. Okay, so, um, so what are the challenges that faculty have faced? In the case of um, the work that's being done right now on classical Latin, we have a really nice corpus that already exists. It's a wonderful world to work in if you're a um, 
Latin, Greek, some of these areas where this has already been built and you know, it goes way back to the, the 80s even starting some of this. But a lot of areas don't have this kind of corpus. And so how we support and develop the kind of complete corpuses that people need to be able to do this kind of work is I think one question that we have. As Peter pointed out, you also have to think about how do you help faculty even think of what is the corpus they need. If you want to start thinking about generation over time of ideas and influences, you often need to go back a lot further than, than you know, where you started. Um, we've also had faculty talk about how can they teach this kind of thing. They want to be able to have students come into a class and actually develop a corpus for themselves. It's not typical that people really want to do these things as academic you know, exercises on a corpus that happens to be available. They actually want to do them on materials that they're interested in their subject area. And so you know, there's been interest in, can we get book machines so students can just sit there and scan a whole group of things at the beginning of the semester, work on that. So you know, again, how are we thinking about supporting these kinds of needs? Another challenge that, that is often faced is that, for instance, in the case of, of the Latin corpus, it exists in one place, but you need to get it out of there to put it in a tool that does some of this kind of mapping and analysis. And often, that does not just mean export-import, it means export transformation and import. Now that transformation often is not actually a very difficult kind of thing. It's the kind of thing a programmer can do relatively easily in a lot of cases, but it's not something that faculty necessarily have the skills and knowledge to do. So they're also starting to look for what kinds of services can there be to help them either actually just have a place and a person they can go to to do that transformation or what kinds of training do we need to be providing to people to be able to learn how to do this kind of thing. Thank you. So we've talked about one type of connections between text. If there are passages which are shared between texts, whether they're quoted or plagiarized or cited, or whether they're just talking about a general idea. But the next example I want to talk about uses a kind of extrinsic connection between texts. And this has to do with um, an, a, the ap application of network analysis techniques to modernist Japanese poetry. And um, we're working with two faculty on this, um, Hoyt Long and Richard So, in uh, Japanese and uh, English, respectively. So this is a trans-departmental project, because many countries have their own modernisms, right? But they're linked by kind of print cultures. So we're both interested in, ang in the Anglo-American world and in the Japanese language world. If you were teaching a class on uh, modernist poetry in Japan, and you were writing a book, giving a seminar, you'd probably be able to rem remember the names of all the poets you're working on, what they looked like. And you'd probably also have a sense of uh, what journals they published in. And you could probably keep a lot of this in your head. And um, as you worked on this class or as you prepared this article, you'd know that certain people um, wrote in certain journals and other people wrote in the same journals, but that other people only wrote in one type of journal. But eventually, at scale, this becomes very complex. But in your head, you'd be keeping this notion of you know, who wrote for the equivalent of the New Yorker and stuff like that. Well, the question we're exploring with network analysis is what happens when you do get this data at scale? So the answer is you get a very complex network diagram. And this network diagram contains nodes, which are just circles, and it also contains edges, which are links between the nodes. And in this case, the nodes are poets, and the edges or the curved lines between the circles are, is, represents the fact that people co-published in the same journal. And if you get this data at scale, you can ask an algorithm to interrogate the data set. You can ask it to interrogate the graph and define clusters of affiliation to detect communities completely algorithmically based on what journals people publish their poems in. At scale, you can get this algorithm to color a bunch of the nodes green, another one blue, and another one purple. And then you can put the resulting visualization in conversation with a humanist, with a literature person who's written a book on 1920s and 30s uh, Japan, poetry. And you can get him or her to say, well, this cluster really makes sense, right? All these people were publishing in the same provincial journals, and this really works. But why did the algorithm cluster these other poets in other places? Um, so that type of conversation between the quantitative knowledge of the algorithm and the qualitative knowledge of the expert in Japanese poetry, we think is very productive. 
Um, we can do this across all sorts of different types of languages. I can show you American poetry um, in the 1920s and, and teens. Um, everything that's orient that's yellow here is a journal. Everything that is um, sort of red is a person. So if I click on uh, New Republic, I'll see all the poets who have published New Republic. You can see these are interactive and exploratory, right? I don't have to know, it's Carl Sandburg. I don't have to know my question before I get in, and I can let the question emerge from the, how the data organizes itself. So, this explodes the question of kind of the kind of corpus that faculty are looking for because not only do they necessarily need the corpus of the, say, all of the, the um, journals that the poets were publishing in, but what actually drives the graphs that you were just seeing is a set of what really is more like bibliographic data. And so, in fact, in the case of Hoyt Long, what he has done is taken a modern reference book. He's been scanning pages in the sections of the areas that he's interested in. It's a book that really is just a bibliography of all the poems published by all the poets in Japan. And he's <coughs> scanning it, OCRing it, and then having to take that data and get it into fielded form to put into an Excel spreadsheet that runs the kind of software that he's interested in. So one question he's asked, of course, is what role could the library play in maybe working with the vendor who's producing this book and saying, you know, is there a way we could get the data in another way? Um, I don't know if any of you have heard of the announcement a couple days ago of Elsevier having worked with the University of British Columbia to provide data mining access to their entire database for the faculty there for research purposes. This, I think, is the kind of thing we need to start looking at, is people are not wanting the data only in the traditional way we've read it, where you have an article that you pull up and read. They want to be able to get at this data in other ways. They want to be able to get at and manipulate the metadata about articles as well. I could imagine also you know, an entire dump of our catalogs as being the kind of data that you could pull into this to again start looking at some of these connections between where people published and, and you know you probably want to take a subset of that data but how do we help support people get things in in the way that they're wanting it I think another question it raises in my mind is the question of what amount of work we would put into digitizing material that's copyrighted for this non-consumptive purpose. We've tended to want to digitize materials that we can put up and make available. And yet faculty, as you know, not surprisingly, want to work in the areas that they work in. And that crosses <laughs> boundaries of, of you know, 1923 time um, Areas. And so I think that question of what role we have providing this kind of work and putting efforts into doing this kind of work um, that we can't share. And thinking about how we also start, start developing the kinds of services that would allow us not to have to, you can imagine faculty may and often are recreating some of this kind of work because they make their own little databases and then that never is able to be reused. So now I want to take us into the domain. Uh, this differs a little bit from Japanese poetry of the 20s, although it keeps the decade. And that is to talk about a project, a very experimental thing we're doing with a Jazz Age uh, magazine in Chicago that was discovered in a wonderful way by a, um, a beloved professor of history at the University of Chicago, Neil Harris, who was walking through our research library, the Regenstein, and discovered this set of bound volumes on the shelf. He just pulled one off and discovered this amazing sort of forgotten Jazz Age competitor to the New Yorker. And I've put up one of the covers um, to the right on the slide there. It's this amazing thing that sort of died out um, after a decade or two, but was at, at, at a kind of one moment was a kind of, you know, envisioned itself as a Chicago equivalent to the New Yorker. It really kind of captured the color and the... Um, the sort of the sights and the sounds of, of the city in a way which we really didn't think we had this kind of documentary evidence of before. So it's rescued from obscurity and the best qualitative work on the Chicago and that ever could be done, which has already been done a couple years ago by Neil Harris, a beautiful monograph with reproductions of many of his covers. 
So we've got the qualitative analysis of this work down, but you could ask yourself, what did Neil Harris find when he pulled a volume off a shelf uh, of a forgotten part of the Regenstein? Did there was the value here the fiction that was printed in the Chicagoan? Uh, maybe the value is the political commentary, if you're a, or a, a historian, about what people thought about race relations in Chicago in the 1930s. Um, maybe the value is the cartoon, if you're, if you're a visualist, you're interested in how did cartoons in the Chicagoan compare with cartoons in the New Yorker. But another question is, maybe the, the text of the Chicagoan could be thought of as their covers. Because the covers are a kind of unique indexical representation of each fortnightly or weekly issue, right? It's designed to sell the issue on the newsstand. It represents that week, just like a New Yorker cover does. So we said, well, if you, how do you have these hundreds of covers in brilliant color, how do you keep all these in your head at once? How do you read dozens or even hundreds of covers? Well, one answer is the mathematical dimensions of images. And by dimensions, I don't mean 11 inches down, eight and a half wide. I mean things like the luminance or the brightness of each cover, the hue of each color of cover, the saturation of each cover. And if you ask a computer algorithm to analyze this corpus of covers from Jazz Aid Chicago, what you can end up with some kind of interesting visualizations. If you graph the hue, the median hue of each cover, so averaging the hue of all the data on the cover each week or each fortnight, the x-axis starts in 1926 and goes to 1935, the y-axis is what hue it is. So you'll see all the blue covers clustering in the middle, the top is red, and the bottom is essentially yellow and green. I'm not sure there's much you can learn from this, but when I showed this saturation graph to Neil Harris, this is the saturation, so stuff at the very top has a lot of color, stuff on the bottom has very little color. It could be black or white, but it has very little color. When I showed this particular graph to Neil Harris, he immediately pointed at one cover. Does anybody know what cover he pointed at? Anybody guess? The very top cover, the green one. He said, we had a Dickens of a time trying to reproduce this, right? It's some sort of crazy spot color green. It was very difficult to get right. The algorithm agrees. This cover is off the charts. So what you want to do is you'd want to, first of all, get the, the entire corpus scanned really well. Uh, we have a sub-sampling uh, sub of the corpus here of all these covers. And you'd want to say, who paint, who drew this, co this cover? And look at the couple yellow ones just down a little bit. Those are also pretty saturated, not as saturated as the green. So can we discover anything about why these covers were so interesting? Was there a new ink that came out, or was there a new designer who designed these covers? That's the type of information you can get at scale from images. And of course, you can do this not just with Jazz Age magazine covers. You could analyze the Quattrocento to discover with when purple ink was introduced or pink, purple pigments, if flat oil painting in the Renaissance became more purple, right? I mean, you can do that just by querying art store. If we can analyze the hue, the saturation, the luminance of individual photos, right? I mean, if you were to flip all these covers uh, right in front of you one by one, you'd almost get like a flip book, right? And so how distant is that from a movie? It's pretty similar, right? A movie is about 24 frames per second, right? So what happens if we think about doing the same type of technique to movies? Movies understood as sequences of images. So to simplify things, we'll do a black and white movie. And the only values that black and white movies have are luminance. The only thing they can tell you is how bright this, the screen is, because unless it's been hand tinted, it doesn't have any color value. So what we can do here is, is of course, Battleship Potemkin, Sergei Eisenstein, the Odessa Steppe sequence. And we can ask questions of this sequence, because really the sequence is just about 18 frames per second of luminance. And the questions we can ask are, how bright is the screen at every instant in the sequence of the Odessa steps? And what does the, the histogram of those values look like? I can show you this on a website. So here we, here we have the Odessa, Odessa step sequence, and I'm controlling it, right? I can make people run up and down the stairs, right? You know, I'm controlling the time dimension. And what you're seeing my move, me move my mouse over is a kind of, uh, I don't know what you call it, an EKG or kind of like a Richter scale visualization of how bright or how dark the images are at every single frame. Now, one of the things you'll discover is there are certain, motion, there are certain points in the timeline when the screen goes really dark. Does anybody guess what those are? Those are intertitles, right? The screen's almost all black. Is anybody familiar with Odessa step sequence? Do you know what the brightest moment in this, in this sequence is? It's a famous point where a woman opens a white umbrella and the white umbrella completely takes over the screen, right? Now, if you were watching this film in Russia, you know, 80 or 90 years ago, it would be brighter than 100% because the uh, projector would be shooting off the silver on the screen right into your eyeball, right? So this is 100%. But this little orange dot here tells me that um, 
This is literally the brightest part in this sequence. And the histogram to the right of the image that I'm controlling, if anybody does digital photography, you'll, re you'll recognize this. This is a representation of most of the pixels here are on the right of the spectrum, so they're very bright, whereas on an inner title, you have a lot of pixels on the left, which is dark. Uh, just before Elizabeth takes over and talks about the, the questions here, just to put this in context, what happens if you take the luminance and you put it in conversation with algorithmic shock detection? As you can tell when Eisenstein cut, right? That's a very, it's a, it's a solved problem. Like iMovie will tell when you cut a scene, right? So you put that in conversation with algorithmic shock detection, and you can do facial recognition to tell when there's one zoom face uh, on a screen in an Eisenstein film. Now, that may seem kind of uh, overkill for a two-minute sequence, but what happens if you took Eisenstein's entire production and you put it into a supercomputer that could do this all at once. You could do all film produced in Russia in a decade, and you could, drill, you could essentially mine the correlations between bright scenes, cut scenes, inner titles, faces, even whether a scene is in focus or not. What you'd have there is essentially a data mining project that tries to answer the questions of how these variables are, are independent or dependent on another. Which then raises the question, really, of starting to think of elements like color, hue, saturation as content in and of themselves, with ma which makes us have to think about our collections in new and different ways. What kinds of things make up a sensical collection when you suddenly have new ways of thinking about it beyond simply the elements that might you know, be the subject matter of, of what's in those, those materials? Um, these kinds of new uses also, I think, make us have to start thinking about and understanding as we digitize materials whether or not we need to change our digitization practices. Now, interestingly, in the case, for instance, of the color analysis, it turns out they don't even need high resolution images for that. You can use very low resolution images and still get it's captured the information that you need. But I think it, it, it still points to the fact that we need to understand these things, that as digital humanities is working on new kinds of techniques, we need to understand what we need to do in our own conversion practices to support what they need. Another example would be the fact that we tend to put these materials up bundled as you know, objects as a whole. You have an entire issue of the Chicagoan. If what's wanted is every individual issue of the cover of the Chicagoan, and if you then want to map that across time, and Peter showed kind of doing it just across the um, spectrum of, of years that it was published, but you could also imagine wanting to say, let's be able to group everything from the you know, spring issues or the fall issues, or you could think of various ways you could pull that together. You need to be able to get that image and you need to be able to get all of that metadata with it. We need to be bundling these in ways that people can get all the elements they need to put into some of these kinds of tools. Um, the last thing I'll mention is I think what we see in looking at what Peter described with the color metrics and the cinemetrics shows how some of these tools with digital humanities go across disciplines. The two faculty members in this case are from very, very different disciplines. Something we didn't have time to get into is the fact that the work that um, Professor Dick is doing on the classical um, you know, corpus sequence alignment, that same technology and approach to doing analysis is now being looked at for music and doing the same thing. We have a new music faculty very interested in the issue of influence and, and um, you know, kind of relationships of music over time. And so what we're finding is we have faculty who need to be brought together to learn and understand these tools and think about, well, how could I apply that to my collection? And they often aren't having those conversations with each other because they're com from completely different parts of the university and don't necessarily bump into each other. And so they're very interested in looking at, and I think they see often the library as the place where they all come together and where this kind of collaboration and communication could be happening. So thank you.